Okay. <laughs> Whatever she said. <laughs> How are y'all doing tonight? Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah. Decent Peach, side. Peach, you Decent. red track is in. Yep. Just give me a sec to get this mouse on. So we are currently getting set up, but while we're getting set up, we'll go ahead and get started. So, how many of y'all, show of hands, have played Persona before? Any of the games? I love y'all so much. <laughs> Those that haven't, don't worry. We're going to be talking about a lot of things other than Persona that mix into the games. So, and you might get a little introduction to the games as well. So, we'll go ahead and get started. Quick question. How many of you know that the manga and the animes actually do connect into carrying on the story? Not so many. Uh, how many of you have heard of Trinity Soul? Wow. That's <laughs> Yeah, that is actually. Because he's never fantastic. heard of it and he played some of the other games. I've played the first three. So I've played Persona 1, 2, and Part 2. I have played 3, 4, and 5. And for those of you who are, how many of y'all are Megami Tensei fans outside of Persona? Okay, to y'all. This might make a lot of sense. <laughs> I, I completely understand them. There's, there's some folks that are sitting there going, Megami Tensei is the only way. And, you know, that's cool. Tons of respect for Megami Tensei too. But we'll go ahead and get started. So, this is the Velvet Panel. So, major spoiler warnings. We're going to go ahead and get started with this. Just so you know, we're about to discuss some major plot points in the games. We're not going to, like, just throw the ending themes at you or anything, but just to let you know, if you're afraid of spoilers, you got to do the mature thing, take your fingers, stick them in your ear, and go la 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 We promise we're not going to spoil the storyline, but we may spoil some of the villains by giving you the information of why they're in the game. Huh. Eh, I but give or take. We're, we're trying not to spoil the story. Also, I absolutely love the picture of the catchy assault band. <laughs> yeah. You know, but we'll go ahead and get started. So how many of y'all, first off, one of the bigger things that we're going to compare Persona 2 in this game, let's say in this game, this panel, is uh, Carl Jung, and he's going to be like the major focal point, but we're going to be talking about other philosophers and psychologists as well. Uh, Carl Jung was a Swiss uh, philosopher and psychologist, and the thing that you need to know about him is he's the founder of analytical psychology. He kind of worked with Sigmund Freud for a while and was trained by him, but you know how like that drama sometimes comes over, comes around? They kind of had different viewpoints. So like basically, he is that guy that's in your class that wants to do absolutely everything all over the place, and you're just in court like, I just want to do the bare minimum and pass this class. Psychology, <laughs> philosophy, and a little bit of mysticism and spiritualism because he's kind of a weird dude. He wrote a book of just his dreams and nightmares. That's kind of his thing. <laughs> now we love free time. So the big thing, though, that you need to know about him, though, when comparing him to Freud is the fact that Sigmund Freud went for the ego, super ego, and the id. He had a completely different way of seeing things, which we'll see in a couple of minutes, but... He didn't agree with Freud, so they kind of had some drama and falling out. It was kind of a big deal. Which we kind of want to show you what someone else's take of one of his ideas was. Yes. Let me shrink this real quick. So we have a video. How many of y'all have seen Persona 1? Because I know it came out recently. Maybe they did a remake of it. Sweet. A couple people. All right, so the thing about Persona 1 is we're going to show you a clip <coughs> of Philemon. And she's going to explain to you who Philemon is for a minute. But this is from the first game. This is from the original first game, it's not, not the remake. Showing the, it's showing the PowerPoint. Give me a question. Yep. Um, you gotta bring the PowerPoint down first. Uh, Revelations Persona or... This like, no, this is the first Persona. Like, it Persona was, 1, Persona 1. It was called Revelations when it came to America. That was the thing. Okay, go ahead and minimize. There we go. We're gonna explain who this dude is in a second. Wait, you ever wonder who that annoying little butterfly was? Well, we're about to inform you exactly who he is. Because he's been long forgotten. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and show you the dude, because for some reason the device does not have a lot of audio. But this gentleman right here, 
is Philemon. He is the person that is your guide, and he sets you on the mission of the Son of Juan. He also has a lot of imagery with Carl Jung, but what would you like to say about Philemon? So, yeah, I know he's a pretty boy. <laughs> Actually, Flamin's got this thing where when he takes his mask off, depending on if you force it off or he willingly takes it off, if he for you force it off, he'll do the exact same face as you. And he will quote exactly what your persona says. Thou art I and I am thou. But if you actually let him take it off himself, he looks like an old man. And I'm talking like probably oh. Chuck Norris. Oh, trust you. <laughs> like, He's not that bad. He's pretty old. No, like she wanted to show like the video originally, and now he's just sitting there with sticks out on there. Because it's like, is this really, he like, takes out the mask, he's like this really old, like, crusty dude face. Like, it's wild. Yeah, and you just watch him turn into butterflies. But he, he is that voice, he is that butterfly that bugs you in every game. Yep. And with the interesting symbolism as well, because we're going to actually point out why he takes the form of a butterfly later down the road. But the Velvet is actually his creation. He actually says it, because that lovely little entrance from that video is actually the original Velvet Room, which was a tower. It was actually the assembled tower of everyone's consciousness, and he was kind of a type of god, or kami. So he stayed there, and he watched over the world until things went awry, and then you got Persona 1. Persona 2, he shows back up for a short period of time, and he actually gives you a chance for a Persona again, but the thing is, with Persona 1 and 2, you actually have direct correlation because you have reused characters. And something you might not have known, the Joker's ability to switch out Persona actually was something kept from the original games for everyone. The other players in your team could have their Persona traded out as long as it was the same Arcana that they were. Now before we get into all the technical stuff, we probably should get into the nitty gritty. The entire reason why we are showing you this dude is because he's central to the story. The thing that you need to remember about him is that all of the events in the Persona games occur because of a bet between two gods. Philemon and Nyarlathotep. And we're going to show you Nyarlathotep in a couple of minutes, but he represents the good side of people's, you know, personalities, the good side of their subconscious. Which, this is what Carl Jung thought you looked like. <laughs> yes. So Carl Jung came up with this idea of Philemon. Now, the first thing you'll hear of Philemon actually comes from the Christian Bible. And it's actually in um, the book of Philemon, where you have Paul's letters to Philemon um, while Paul is in jail. And one of the things that you need to know about Philemon as Carl Jung saw him is that Carl Jung, like I mentioned, believed that he saw dreams of characters from history or from lore and from myth. And he saw Philemon appear to him in a dream and basically was telling him that he was going to show him how the subconscious worked. And the thing that you need to know about Philemon is that... The reason why Carl Jung started dabbling into the whole spiritualism and that sort of stuff is because of the fact that there was a bird that he saw on the ground that matched the wings of Philemon the day after he had that dream. A so butterfly's much better, huh? Yeah, it's kind of optimal, you know, better than a dead bird, yeah. But pretty much the thing is, is this is actually ties directly into his books. It's actually part of the Red Book, which is um, something you can have to get to the virtual library. Um, they actually let you... So, you can tell who got to play the games more and who got to do research like a drugstore. Do you feel like you want to look up a bunch of old men's dreams? You just want to be just feeling bored one day? Hey, you, know, Again, you can tell who got to actually have fun. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So many books. So many websites. Which oh. actually brings us to, yeah, the game chose a butterfly because there was one line that Carl Jung did say. Was, am I a man dreaming to be a butterfly, or am I a butterfly dreaming to be a man? And this ties into Shuang Tzu, which said the same thing in his butterfly poem. In um, his poem, The Butterfly Dream, the entire purpose of it was to kind of question what exactly is reality, and what exactly is it in response to our consciousness. 
because he dreamed that he was a butterfly, but when he awoke, he couldn't remember having been a man while he was the butterfly. So he wonders, am I a butterfly thinking that I am a man, or am I a man that thinks I'm a butterfly? Which is where you get the issues from Persona 4, where you got the people who are fighting their shadows because, hey, I want to deny you, but I de deep down do know I am you. I just want to deny you. <laughs> and that actually, the reason why she mentions that is it ties into the first half that comes before that talk, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So, <laughs> let's go ahead and move on. Wait, um, just so we get to Navarlatep. This is not Yarlapatep. Sorry, I might have grabbed the wrong one. You got the wrong one. That's, that's Force of Will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to like this one much better because this is what he really looks like. Yes. <laughs> so you, you, you want the little girl? One, the skinless one, the crawling chaos. How many of y'all are Cthulhu fans? Cthulhu fans? You the guys great are chaos god of the movie. <laughs> Destroyer of worlds. <laughs> so H.P. Lovecraft, love his stuff. So, Yarlathotep, we couldn't find a picture from the games because he keeps changing shape. And the you know, we felt known as Hitler. <laughs> yeah, we didn't want to plaster Hitler all over our panel. <laughs> he took the form of Hitler in one point of the game, and it's like what all of the pictures online are. We know he is Hitler from. for three games. <laughs> Not kidding. One, two, part two. He is Hitler. <laughs> he represents the evil end of a person's cognition, and the reason why they picked Nyarlathotep is because in H.P. Lovecraft, there is a couple of times that he's referenced, but in the main poem, Nyarlathotep, Nyarlathotep is described as a man looking somewhat like a pharaoh, but that can change his shape and shows miracles to the people. The problem is, is that these miracles are horrific, and by the time it's over with, they have become mindless in a lot of ways. He just, it just, it brings devastation to the world. And the number one thing is, he could wake up all of the other Eldritch gods if he really wanted to in the books. So imagine that little girl gets mad at you and goes, you know what, I'm just going to destroy the world today. Angry Chibi, anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so that actually, like, that's an end spoiler for one, two, and part two. And the That's why he played as a butterfly. Because he made a deal. He won that contest. Because he picked some people, they won that fight. He got stuck as a butterfly, and now Tharlathep got stuck in a cage. And he's responsible as well for the majority of demons that appear in the stories. Although one important plot point that we do need to mention, you mentioned to me earlier that there was a reason why they don't show up in the latter games after two, wasn't it? Oh yeah! Um, uh, did you guys know there's an age restriction on when you can have your persona? Huh? Yeah! Uh, you remember how I asked about Trinity Soul? Did you know that one of the main characters for Persona 3 actually makes a appearance in the anime? And he states that I am now too old, even with the invoker drugs, to call a Persona. That's why you don't see them in later, because they've aged out. The Persona 3 happens 10 years before Trinity. Which means all our characters from 3 and 4 have aged out of the ability to have their persona. Which, let's see, personas happen between the age of 10, from the earliest from what we've seen, to around 20 to 25. Anyone got a guess on why that might be? And dogs. Dogs count. Yes, they do. Dogs weirdly really enough count after being 3. Between 10 to the age of 25-26. Yes, but also that's when you're finding who you are. Because you're finding who you are... <laughs> Some of us, like me, might not have quite gotten there yet. <laughs> because you are still finding who you are, your persona is developing. Because you've ever noticed as the game progresses, your persona grows. All I know is you need to dance. <laughs> <laughs> it's why the concepts in the first three games was that your friends as well as you could change. But what I meant was the reason why Nyarlathotep and Philemon don't show up anymore. Oh, I thought I mentioned that they were... No, you, okay. you jumped they, right into the... Okay, <laughs> so I'm being a spaz case. Yes. Okay. One final comment. Yes? Sure. Age of 10 through 25 is your strongest protagonist with us. 
Yeah. That too. Yes. <laughs> but that, you're the weirdest, strange dad. <laughs> 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 you gotta may or may not die before the show's over. It may have died previously and never shows up. <laughs> but if they do, they're always cranky and they're always like disillusioned to the world. Well, that's the thing. Is it cool to have them all alone? Sometimes. Uh, yeah. It might be. Grandma's are all good. If it's Avatar, yep. you've got a good shot. Well, you guys, hopefully that's it. <laughs> 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 the, the reason Persona 1, 2, and 3 started was because Flamin and Natharlotep had a bet to see who would win. With Natharlotep reaching into the darkness of people's selves, or with Flamin choosing a handful of people who had a light self. And the bet, if won, they would both be sealed. Layman creating the persona and Narlathotep making the shadows. Shall we look? Which brings us to this. What do we mean by the self? Yes. <laughs> because that's going to be something that. <laughs> yeah. You ready to laugh all Okay, so by the self, what we're talking about is who we truly are. And Carl Jung and both Carl Jung and the games, especially four, talk very, very in depth about what the self is. Carl Jung specifically said that the dream shows the inner truth and the reality of the patient as it really is. Not as I conjecture it to be, and not as he would like it to be, but what it actually is. That is why we slowly transition from us fighting with personas in the real world with a cross zone that's not shown. Sorry. So, the entire thing about the self is that we don't necessarily know who we actually are, and we, the entire point of life is to discover that. To discover what our interests are, what it is that we make us passionate, what we hate, what we love. Who what makes us the Joker. <laughs> and the big thing is, is that this is going to tie into Persona, but the one thing I want to make early on very clear is that the Persona is not the self. They are very different. Yep. Persona can be from anything. You could be what your neighbor thinks you are, could be from what your interactions to a friend is. It could even be what you see yourself as. But cover what, you, cover what it means in the games. But in the games, it literally is meaning how you interact with everything around you. Because if you notice with our main protagonists, they can do a multitude of things. They can fit any kind of niche because they weren't in one to begin with. But all your confidants, all your bonded people, all the other people who have persona, they fit a niche and they've been in that niche for a while. And I think we need to backtrack just a hair because some of y'all haven't played persona. So we probably need to mention early on, persona is a JRPG. Uh, the main <laughs> thing about persona though, is that there are two separate modes of the game that constantly alternate. The first one is it's very similar to a like visual novel where you talk to characters and you form relationships. And you and the, like the story is very dark. It's very serious, and a lot of things happen that can be really disturbing at times. But there's also that's why they got named after commies. Yes, but which god or any second, kind of comedy do you know that didn't screw up? The the second half of the game though is a combat RPG where all of those relationships that you form with people allow you to summon characters from myth, history, fantasy. You know, very legendary characters, things like the angel Raphael, and so on and so forth, to fight nine, other you know, demons and cognitive beings Orochi. to achieve whatever the goal at the end of the game is. And it varies from game to game. But the big thing is you also fight shadows, which we're going to talk about later on, which are basically sort of the exaggerated negative parts of your cognition. And we'll talk about what those are in depth in a second. But... Did someone have a quick question? Yeah. Because it looked like somebody wanted to say something. Because if we've got you confused or anything, you can always ask us a backtrack question. No, we don't mind. Good. You're good. I know we've had a confusing start. No. But, um... But you got to admit we're being funny. Which one had But, um, Persona, in Carl Jung's perspective, was the idea that we all wear a sort of mask for different people. And these masks may change, but these are not necessarily bad. It's our attempt to relate to another person. Like, if you know that a person is a certain way, you may act a little bit more like they do, so that way you understand them better. You can understand, like putting on somebody else's shoes. The only thing is, though, is that this is not our self. It's a part of who we are, but if we think that it's our self, it can become very confusing. 
How many of you have noticed the eye color when it comes to the game? Good. If you really have paid attention, anyone notice that the shadows we meet in Persona 4, well, the Persona still are shadows at the same time, ironically. They're tangled, yeah. But we're going to get the shadows. We're going to okay. I'm jumping ahead because it randomly popped in my head. Forgive the ADHD. Well, I know we're on a time crunch, but... That but that is Carl Jung's version of it. Which we have covered. Yep. Okay. okay. You guys ever wondered why Flame... The, you know now why Flamen is no longer the host, the main host, or the person in charge of the Velvet Room? Did, because he made that bet and he won, both him and the Naratep are trapped. Igor shows up in the second two games because he replaces his master. You ever wondered why Igor says, my master is away, on a very rare occasion? It's because he's voiced by Vic Mignogna now in Old Maps. Because the original voice actor is gone. Don't go there. He's <laughs> <laughs> a job, I'm just saying. Like, he is nice. overused. Vic Mignogna is incredible. We shall agree to disagree. Well, did you guys know that the attendants that we meet later on aren't actually the original attendants? Yep. They do more than switch. We actually kept the same two attendants for three of the games. You know the song that likes to play in the Velvet Room? We actually meet the singer and the piano man in two and one. The part one and part two of two. <coughs> Isn't that a surprise? Yeah, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah it's not that big. You need to know about the attendants. They represent different archetypes. Now, what archetypes essentially are is they are basically parts of our cognition that are sort of kind of how our personalities sort of sync up. It's believed that we actually will live through a vast number of archetypes in our lifetime. Things like, you know, there's people that kind of act like the craggedy old man, or, you know, some people that act like a mother figure. Whether they're a mother or not, they might follow the mother archetype to a certain extent. And they fit into these different little niches. And it was believed by Carl Jung, whether it's true or not, that everybody goes through a set number of these over the course of their life, but which ones varies from person to person. And just so you know, even if you beg and plead for your attendant to be a female, and you end up with a male, and you're a female, it ain't happening. You're stuck with that male. <laughs> Here's the thing that I found upsetting, though, and I don't know how many of y'all can relate to this. Why in the world, after Persona 3, could we never play a female protagonist? Why was it just... Yeah, did anyone notice that you actually got to play a female antagonist in 3? I'm just kind of upset. But here's you know what their answer was? It would have added too much to the story and then too boring. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, they said it would take too long and it'd be too boring to have a female antagonist as well. Right. Yeah. There's a reason why I'm upset about this, which we will cover later. So here's yeah, the we have a little bet, and you'll find out the results. <laughs> Some of the archetypes that Carl Jung talked about are also represented by the members of the Velvet Room. Like, I'm pretty, I, I feel pretty confidently that Igor is the old man, but regarding the actual attendants, they could be the anima and animus of people. It is believed that every person who has an archetype that is the opposite of whatever they believe their gender is. So, for example... That's why I said, if you want a guy or a girl, good luck. ...has a female attendant that is associated with them. However, the female protagonist has a male attendant. The anima is supposed to represent all of the female traits of a person's personality. And the animus is supposed to be the male traits. And it varies. If somebody's suppressing their animus, they may be more leaning more towards the feminine than the male. Whereas if they're suppressing their male, these might be these macho guys who go to the gym all the time and are like just, you know, I wear short sleeve shirts with a long sleeve shirts with a short sleeve shirt. You know, those guys. Good, good example. You guys remember the attendant from Four, the best? And you? You notice how she's got a lot of texture to her, but he's a little dry? All his personality went to her. 
But what I thought was cool, though, is that the female can actually have Theodore or Elizabeth as hers. So, just I don't that that's the only one that actually got to pick which one they got. Indeed. Although how the one in Persona 5 had two attendants at once is kind of wild. But we yeah, won't get spoilers. We're, no spoilers. We're, we're, we're not going into that one. Going to be good, so we're going to move on. But, the big thing. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, partially related to the story in, Persona, in the Persona spinoffs, Theodore shows up even though he's exclusive to the female storyline. Which makes it really confusing after that. Yeah. Point. yeah he because you something. can't pick him in Persona 3 if you play the guy character. <coughs> Which is kind of why a lot of people didn't believe the anime, especially Trinity or the mangas, were attached. And is because they thought it was another universe altogether. Because... Yeah, you, you, you got that, you got theater showing up later on, and you're like, what happened? Did we just have timelines mixed up together? Did we just have our uh, deus ex machina happen? That's just a theory. No, we're not going to do Yeah. <laughs> 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 you take that one home. All right, let's, let's move on. Okay. Well, so, too long on the attendance. Yeah. But the now I can brag about shadows. Okay. Shadows are are actually Persona, just not attached to the person full force. Yeah, you know how we can capture the shadows? That's because they are Personas, they're just not attached to anyone anymore. They are a shadow, they are a Persona who has not developed like a hatchling. It's a leveling process. With the exception of Personas 4 and 5, where some shadows are actually associated with specific people. And there's a reason for that as well. The reason why we chose this very specific quote, which you're seeing on the screen here, is that this is the first quote of the Butterfly Dream, which kind of represents the attitude that the shadows in four, that the shadows, especially in Persona 4, have at times. This idea of why do I have to listen to, you know? Which you might have the shadow that eats a little too many shadows, and then you get the shadow of what are you denying? The entire thing about shadows and Carl Jung's philosophy is that shadows were supposed to represent the unconscious part of our minds. The part of our minds that we either don't know that we're denying or that we do know and just don't want to face. It's the part of our personalities that we are ashamed of, but they could be positive traits or negative, but we just don't feel like we can bring them to life. The problem with denying your shadows, however, much like the games, is that if you deny your shadow for too long, it will start creeping its way into your actions. You will start exhibiting those traits, whether you want to or not, a lot of the time. Like, for example, if you're a compulsive liar, and you're really trying not to be. Maybe Which is one of the reasons in up. 5, the book gets flipped. If you notice, they're basically giving out the persona of who they really are, who is their shadow, yes. as their helper. Whereas they're being represented in mankind and in the real world as something completely different. Because of the fact that in Persona 5, they're shamed for the things that they value. But they accept them. Yusuke's creativity and his sense of justice. You know, Ryuji's sense and determination of facing against others so that way he can save his friends. Things like that. Things where other people have oppressed you to the point where you are repressing these good traits about yourself is what Persona 5 was about. Yeah, but Persona 4, the people were trying to deny what it was and hide it themselves of their own militia. And that's why they tried to kill them. However, the shadows are exaggerations at the same time. They don't really exaggerate or embellish mm -hmm. whatever it is that is the negative trait to an extreme. Ever had someone uh, borrow something from you, and it's not really that big a deal, but because they did something and broke it, you lose it? Yeah. That's basically what you get with shadows. And it's one of the reasons why Persona 3 is kind of weird, <coughs> at the same time with the Persona 1 and 2 and 3, or Part 2, because you don't really see them hiding who they are, but more of coming to acceptance and taking it, even though you don't really understand why they're hiding it in the first place. And shadows in the game will start off, for those who haven't played for the Persona games, they will start off looking like the character, but they'll have weird yellow eyes, and they'll say things the character would never say because they don't want to tell the truth about their lives. And when the person denies them, they get freedom. They get to become whatever it is they want to be, and they become these horrible monsters that they have to deal with. 
But the only way to stop them is for the person to accept them. And that's the entire way that you deal with shadows in Carl Jung's book as well, is accepting them so that way you can find a way to deal with them, to understand yourself better, and to you know, be able to find some way to work through whatever it is you're trying to work through. Which brings us to Carl Jung's three-factor model. We are, yes, this is I all know. him. This is all him. I this played the game. This is all him. This how I felt in the library. So, right here. And I'm the one with the hook. fabulous MS paint trap. Uh, <laughs> you know he's really making this. You so, right here, we have the ego. He kept the whole, you know, Sigmund Freud thing of the ego. But this actually represents... Oh, hello. I don't know what Careful. I'm talking about. This is our actual known conscious. This is what we know our consciousness to be, how we act, how we know we act. Um, this is our personal unconscious. So this is the self, essentially. This here is where our shadows would be. The goal is to come to terms with our shadows so they can be a part of our ego. However, our shadows and our ego are affected by the collective unconscious, which we will talk about in a bit, but for the sake of this current graph, our collective unconscious is how we respond to the people around us. You know, whether it be politics, whether it be, you know, any of that boring stuff you see on TV all the time. You, 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 ever, had, you, you ever had that one friend who's got that big opinion and you don't really agree with them, but at the same time, deep down, you do agree with them, but outside, you... Okay, so I'm the only one who's played fake friend for someone just because they were having a bad day? Let's just say that during that whole new situation between Korea and America, and all of the other biz, that Hawaii was definitely having their collective unconscious very much affected. So we'll yeah, like, that. oh, we're so grateful we're not, wait, we are attached to them. So, oh, that was hard. So, I don't know. No, no, in my head. Yeah, which brings us to ego versus personal unconscious, the palaces. Anyone ever wondered about those? Well, the palaces are very interesting in the way they come out. Did you know they're actually palaces in Persona 4? They're just not labeled? Uh, yeah. You know those lovely little situations where a person's grabbed and dragged in? They're dragged into their palaces. And they have to face their shadow. It was actually Persona 3, though, too, that they weren't labeled because they didn't well, they didn't call them houses. They called it. They the did in the shadow. anime. They did in well, the anime. In the, in the anime, they finally actually labeled it, but when you actually play the game, they didn't. But yeah. in three, it was kind of just one big hodgepodge of a giant palace. Yep. It was everyone's game. Everyone's game. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something a lot of people don't connect together until they actually look at both games. And you kind of have a palace in the first three, but it's not exactly the same. It's a little middle ground. It's Flame is home, and it's connected to everyone, and it's supposed to be a palace.